Hi everyone, my name is Ryan Claude, uh, and I'm the president of OCD Rhode Island, and I'm also the director of Child and Adolescent OCD Services um, at RICBT, a group psychotherapy practice specializing in cognitive behavioral therapy. And today what we're going to be talking about is the role of family accommodation in OCD. And so before we get started, um, there's a couple things we're going to go over throughout um, our time together. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll be able to understand the following. And so hopefully you'll be able to get a better understanding of the cognitive behavioral model of OCD and the role of exposure and response prevention in the treatment of OCD. You'll be able to define and identify family accommodation. You'll be better able to understand the function of accommodation and maintaining your family member's anxiety. And you'll learn interventions to assist your family member in resisting engaging in compulsions and avoidance of anxiety provoking situations. And so at any time during the course of this talk, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, drop them in the chat um, and I'll make sure to answer them as I can. Um, and again, if, if at the end of this talk there's questions as well, um, I will post my email up at the end so you can feel free to email me with any questions um, that you may have. And so in order to understand family accommodation, we have to first understand what OCD is. And so OCD is obsessive compulsive disorder. And when we think about OCD, there's two components. There's obsessions and compulsions. And the best way to think about obsessions are there are intrusive thoughts, images, urges, or impulses that are unwanted, and they cause a significant amount of distress. And by distress, we mean anxiety. It could be guilt. It could be shame. Um, and sometimes it can even look like irritability or anger, um, or in some cases, incompleteness, this uncomfortable sense of things not feeling the right way. Um, and so someone with OCD, um, when they ha these thoughts show up for them, um, again, they cause a great deal of distress and, and they're unwanted. So it's really important to remember that these thoughts are not um, enjoyable. They're not thoughts that the individual wants um, and that um, they go to great lengths to try to get rid of these thoughts. And the thoughts they experience are no different than thoughts that people without OCD experience. Um, it's just the way they respond to them that's a little bit different um, and that causes um, increased anxiety and distress over time. And so in an order to attempt to get rid of these thoughts or to prevent these thoughts of worry from happening, um, individuals engage in what are known as compulsions. And compulsions are um, repetitive behaviors um, that people engage in in order to get rid of anxiety or in order to reassure themselves that nothing bad is going to happen or to neutralize that thought. Um, and so common examples often look like hand washing. It could be needing to arrange or order things in a particular way. Um, and, and they can also be behaviors one engages in in the mind. And so things that you won't really see out in the environment, right? So if someone's washing their hands, that's something you could visibly see them doing. Um, but sometimes what people might do is they might um, engage in some type of mental ritual of praying, um, counting. Um, it could be repeating certain words or mantras in order to neutralize some of the thoughts or to try to eliminate them. And again, these are excessive, they're time consuming, um, and again, the individual doesn't want to engage in these behaviors, but it's the only way they see um, in order for them to get rid of the thought and to um, downregulate some of the distress they're experiencing. And we're going to talk a little bit more about um, the relationship between obsessions and compulsions in a minute. So again, just to be clear, obsessions are intrusive thoughts, images, urges, or impulses that are unwanted and cause distress. 
compulsions are repetitive behaviors individuals engage in in order to neutralize thoughts, reassure themselves that their thought of worry isn't going to happen, and to downregulate or get rid of um, unwanted or uncomfortable um, emotions or physical sensations. And so I think a really common example in OCD that many people um, are aware of is contamination obsessions. And so uh, for many um, people, they worry about becoming contaminated. Um, and so if we were to kind of break this down, right, the, the obsession is a fear of contamination, worries about acquiring an illness. It could be worries about getting other people sick. It could be uh, a disgust reaction. Um, and it's often tied into um, either a fear of harm coming to self or others in the form of acquiring illness or spreading an illness, um, or just an uncomfortable sense of feeling gross or disgust and feeling dirty. And so in the two examples we have presented here, um, one situation that's really common is someone might touch a door handle, say in the bathroom, and then the thought that pops into their mind is, what if there's feces or urine on that door handle and now that's on my hand? And if I don't do anything to get rid of that germ contaminant from my hand, um, what if that I spread that to other surfaces or objects or other people and now I'm responsible for spreading those contaminants and possibly um, causing other people to get sick. Um, and so the obsession is, right, the, the fear of spreading the contaminant or the fear of getting someone else sick or getting sick myself. And the compulsion one would engage in is to wash their hands. Um, Another example might be the trigger is the urge to have to go to the bathroom and have a bowel movement, okay? And as they're going to the bathroom, they go to start to wipe themselves. Um, and even though there's no soil, visible soil on the toilet paper left, they still feel dirty or they feel like there's some left behind. Um, so they continue to wipe. And so now they're using an excessive amount of toilet paper or wiping themselves until they feel clean. Um, and so another core component of OCD is avoidance. And so when you encounter a situation that causes anxiety or distress and triggers an intrusive thought or an obsession, um, there's always the urge to perform a compulsion. Um, but the mind also gets very creative and kind of tells you all of the things you need to avoid doing. And so with germ contamination, that often looks like avoiding touching certain surfaces one perceives to be contaminated. And in the latter case, it might look like avoiding having a bowel movement altogether. And so with really young kids with germ contamination, they might actually hold their um, bladder and um, avoid voiding. And so as they do that, what might happen over time is they actually become impacted or constipated um, from avoiding going to the bathroom. Um, and so this is kind of a common example, but it's not the only one. Okay. So, um, there are a variety of different types of obsessions people experience, and there's a variety of different compulsions people engage in. Um, and they, they ebb and flow and they change over time. And so the most common one is germ contamination worries. Um, but second to that is a fear of harm coming to self or others or acting on an unwanted impulse to harm others, um, such as stabbing oneself or others, um, or touching a child inappropriately um, might be another example. Um, and then there's other types of different obsessions as well um, and compulsions um, that have been discussed in other talks in this series. And so for the sake of, of our talk today, we're gonna really stick in the realm of germ contamination. Um, and we, we might bring in other examples of other types of obsessions and compulsions as we go through it. Um, but to better able to uh, help you understand what accommodation looks like and uh, things you can engage in to reduce some of the accommodation in the home, we're going to use this as our kind of ex our base example for the night. 
And so when we think about cognitive behavioral therapy, there's three core components. And, and that is that our thoughts influence how we feel, how we feel influences how we behave, and how we behave influences how we think. And there's a really fancy term for this, which is called reciprocal determinism. Uh, and basically all it's saying is that how we perceive or appraise situations um, out in the environment and within ourselves um, influences how we feel and that how we feel then tends to influence how we then behave in the world. Um, and th it becomes this vicious cycle um, that kind of maintains itself over time. And so when we're applying this specifically to OCD, um, there's always some type of trigger or situation that um, precedes the obsessive belief or the intrusive thought. And so sometimes the trigger can be the thought itself. So we know that obsessions can pop into one's mind and kind of come out of nowhere, almost unprovoked by any external stimulus. Um, but oftentimes there's a, a situation or a stimulus within the environment that one encounters or exposes themselves to that triggers this thought. Um, and so if we were to go back to our contamination example, uh, a trigger for somebody with a fear of acquiring an illness or becoming contaminated uh, might be touching a door handle um, that um, other people have touched. Um, and so for this example, right, somebody touches the doorknob, they're getting ready to leave the bathroom, they touch that doorknob, they open the door, the thought pops in, what if you're contaminated? What if something bad happens? What if you get sick? What if you spread those contaminants? What if you get other people sick? Okay. And just, just take a step back for a minute and imagine if that showed up for you every time you touched a door handle, you would feel anxious. You would, you would feel distressed. And so oftentimes these thoughts are unlikely or the probability of them happening is low. Right. So one might say, like, I know that by touching a doorknob, the likelihood of me getting sick um, is fairly low. But there's always that kind of what if. Well, but what if I do? And as you start to kind of doubt whether or not your feared outcome is going to occur, anxiety starts to mount. And then there's this urge to control or get rid of anxiety. And as you notice this urge to control or get rid of anxiety, the mind gets really creative and it starts to generate all of these things you need to do in order to ensure that one, that obsessive belief doesn't occur and two, to make you feel a little less anxious. And so in the example of germ contamination, the compulsion might be to wash one's hands. It might be that they have to use a certain amount of soap they might be, they have to count to a certain number while they're washing their hands. They might need to go back and rewash their hands. And then it can extend out and it can start to dictate what you can and can't touch. And it can start to tell you that you need to use certain barriers um, to prevent your hands from coming into contact to certain items or objects one perceives to be contaminated. And so for this example, um, if a person touches a doorknob they perceive to be contaminated, they need to wash their hand. Um, or if they are getting ready to touch that door handle and they don't want their hand to become contaminated, they're going to use their sleeve as a barrier and they're going to pull it down over their hand and they're going to use the sleeve to open the door or they might use their elbow or their foot. And the same goes for the toilet flusher or the toilet seat. Um, and so the problem here is the more you engage in a compulsion, the more you have to do that behavior and the more um, complex the behavior becomes and the more things you have to avoid and the more compulsions you have to engage in. And so it starts real really small where, okay, I can wash my hands after touching them. That's not really that big of a deal. Um, but then it escalates to having to wash your hand after touching every item or object within your home. And now you're washing your hands, say, you know, anywhere from 20 to 50 times a day. You're using five to 10 pumps of soap per hand wash. You're washing for over 20 seconds, up to maybe five or 10 minutes. 
and you're needing to rewash if your hand hits the inside of the sink basin on your way out. Um, and, and so it can become very time consuming again, but it can also lead to hands being chapped and raw, and it can lead to um, one being able to do less things within the world um, because they're avoiding so many things um, and aren't able to touch so many different things that um, they're not able to engage in certain behaviors that they enjoy. And so in order to better understand why compulsions don't work in the long run, we have to understand the difference between positive and negative reinforcement. And so really quickly, I think a good way to think about this um, is when you're engaging in a compulsion, there's a drastic reduction in anxiety, which leads to temporary relief. And the stronger that um, relief from anxiety, the more likely you are to engage in that behavior in the future, the behavior that you performed following the reduction in your anxiety. And so positive reinforcement is when following the performance of a behavior, you apply an appetitive stimulus or something someone desires. So kind of think of if you have a pet at home, specifically a dog, um, when you're first teaching your dog how to sit, you give it a command, you say sit. And every time that dog follows through and performs the behavior you're prompting, what do we usually do? We give it a treat. And so we pair the behavior we want them to engage in with something they desire. And so they're more likely to perform that behavior in the future. For OCD and anxiety, the opposite is true. When you remove an uncomfortable physical sensation following the completion or performance of a behavior, you reinforce the behavior one engaged in. And so if we were to go back to our model really quick, when that thought pops in that I'm dirty and contaminated and I'm going to get sick and I start to feel anxious and then I go and wash my hands, it works in the moment. There's a drastic reduction in anxiety and that thought goes away. The thought is dismissed and it says, okay, well, now that you're clean, you're safe and nothing bad's going to happen. Until what happens? Until the next time you encounter that same stimulus. And so as soon as you engage in a compulsion, after coming into contact with an item you perceive to be contaminated, there's a drastic reduction in anxiety and distress, but it's only temporary. And then the next time you encounter that same situation, your mind says, oh, well, last time you touched the doorknob and you felt this way, and you notice this thought that you were going to get sick and die. You washed your hands and nothing bad happened. You didn't die, you felt better. So therefore, you should go ahead and wash your hands again. And you should always do that. Every time you touch an item that triggers this thought and triggers this uncomfortable uh, physical sensation or emotion. And that's where actually engaging in a compulsion is what maintains the cycle of anxiety and OCD. So the more you're engaging in the compulsion, you don't allow yourself the opportunity to learn that what you're worried is going to happen doesn't if you do not perform the compulsion. And you don't learn that anxiety is transient and that it will pass. And so the myth here is that we don't really have to do anything with anxiety. We can't really control our thoughts and feelings. They're going to show up. And it's our job to notice them and make room for them and choose to respond to them in a way that we know is going to be helpful for us, the individual, not OCD. And so we label this kind of opposite action. When it tells you to wash, we're gonna resist washing, we're gonna intentionally touch that item, and we're gonna to start to cross contaminate and touch other items and sit with feeling dirty and find out through our experience whether or not what we're worried is going to happen, such as getting sick or dying, 
if it occurs or not. And so it's learning how to tolerate uncertainty and learning to sit with the anxiety until it passes. Um, and so when you're engaging in compulsions, it's often at the expense of doing what you want to do. Um, and it often gets in the way of being able to um, do everyday routines or chores around the house. So when obsessions are tri triggered, there's automatically this strong urge to perform a compulsion, to get rid of the anxiety, or to avoid situations that lead us to feel uncomfortable. And so as anxiety climbs, the options that are available, we call this our behavioral repertoire, it really narrows. And so someone says, no, I'm contaminated, I have to wash. It's like that's the only option and you have to do it. And if you don't do it, what you're worried is going to happen to is going to happen. No ifs, and or buts. And that's not true. Because there's a whole host of other outcomes and there's a whole host of other behaviors you could engage in. And so you could touch the doorknob, you could avoid touching the doorknob, you could wash your hands after touching the doorknob, you could touch the doorknob and then go eat with your hands, you could touch the doorknob and then go touch someone else and not tell them. And so the more anxious we become though, those options seem to kind of fall off the map and it and there's this strong urge to only perform the one behavior our mind is telling us. And so the function of these behaviors is to avoid sitting with anxiety, uncomfortable sensations or distress, and to um, prevent a feared outcome from happening. And when I say that, it doesn't actually prevent it from happening, but when you perform the compulsion and what you're worried about doesn't, our brain misattributes the reason for why what we were worried about didn't happen to us performing the compulsion. And so how does this work? Okay. You know, what is exposure therapy? Okay. So we know what OCD is now. We know how it works. We know that compulsions make us feel better in the short term, but they don't work in the long term. Okay. So what do we do? Okay. And basically what we need to do is what's known as exposure and response prevention. And exposure and response prevention is an evidence-based treatment for OCD, where one intentionally exposes themselves to situations that trigger obsessions and they actively practice resisting engaging in compulsions. And so the more one does this, their anxiety starts to climb. But when it gets to a point where we want to avoid or escape, or we notice the urge to engage in a compulsion, if we do, there's a drastic reduction again, right? And it comes down. And we don't learn that what we were worried about didn't occur. And we fail to habituate. And habituate basically means that the longer you sit with an uncomfortable thought or feeling, it will start to pass on its own and that level of distress will naturally come down. And so it's not necessarily that we feel less anxious per se, but it's that um, we learn how to make room for the uncomfortable sensation and respond to it differently. And so, for example, if you ever think of a time when you've jumped into a really cold pool, there's this initial urge to get out of the pool. And if you do, you're going to feel better. You're going to feel less cold. But you're not going to learn that if you stay in the water, that the water gets warmer. But here's the thing. The water doesn't actually get warmer. The temperature of the water doesn't change. But your body adjusts to it. And so just like if you were to jump in a really cold pool and stay in it after 10 or 15 minutes, it doesn't really feel that cold. And that's the same with anxiety. If you expose yourself to a situation that makes you anxious, your anxiety is going to start to climb. And if you resist engaging in a compulsion or leaving this situation, it'll peak 
but then it will start to come down all on its own. And the more you do that, the easier it becomes until you no longer need to engage. Uh, you no longer need to avoid those situations that previously made you anxious or where you learned an association that the situation was unsafe. And so you learn that the situation you used to avoid or you paired with a feared outcome is actually not unsafe. It's safe and you can tolerate it and you can engage in it and nothing bad is going to happen or that the likelihood of something bad is going to happen is very low. And if it did occur, that you're able to handle it. Okay, so again, looking here, just kind of briefly reviewing, exposure is intentionally engaging in a situation, whether that's a thought, image, object, or place that makes you anxious. The response prevention priest is actively choosing to not perform the compulsion, make room for that anxiety, and switch to noticing what you're experiencing and what you're feeling without trying to get rid of it. It's tough, but it works. So again, obsession, compulsion, the more you do it, the more you engage in the exposure and resist compulsion, anxiety comes down. You learn that the situation that previously was unsafe is now safe and tolerable. So what's family accommodation? You know, where does family accommodation come into play? And family accommodation is basically, in the most simplified terms, when you engage in a compulsion on behalf of your loved one. And so there's a variety of different ways in which families accommodate, but it's the most common ways are when someone takes part in a ritual, they allow the individual to avoid a situation that makes them anxious, or they modify their routine in order to make it more manageable or less distressing for their loved one. And so there's four reasons why people accommodate, okay? And the first one is there's this strong desire to reduce our family members' distress. And so when someone comes to you and they're really anxious and they're pleading with you to do everything and anything you can to make them feel better, we feel anxious, right? Nobody likes to see someone they care about suffer. And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I don't know, I don't wanna label that, but part of being human is that we all experience pain and suffering in different ways. And as a society, we're, we don't do a very good job at um, practicing tolerating uncomfortable or distressing thoughts and feelings. We often do everything and anything we can to get rid of them. And sometimes that works, but with OCD, it often backfires and it makes the situation worse. The more you suppress or the more you try to reduce one's anxiety, the more anxious they become. And so the first and foremost reason families accommodate is to reduce their family members' distress, okay? And that makes sense, okay? Nobody likes to see other people in distress. The second reason is there's a desire to reduce our own personal distress associated with seeing someone else, okay? And so if somebody comes to you and they're, they're you know, pleading with you to wash your hands, right? So a common one with germ contamination is an individual might, with OCD might monitor you and kind of notice what you're touching throughout the house. And you might touch something that you know is not contaminated, but the in individual perceives it to be contaminated and it's something they avoid. And so they notice you do it and they, they start to get really anxious because they're noticing now you're touching other things. So more things in the home environment are becoming contaminated. And they're saying, hey, stop, you need to go wash your hands. You're dirty. You need to wash your hands. And so now they're requesting you to perform a ritual. They're requesting that you wash your hands or you avoid touching something that's contaminated. 
And so as they're demanding this of you and they're becoming anxious and overwhelmed, you're becoming anxious and overwhelmed and you might give in and then wash your hands. Okay. So again, one reason, reduce another's distress. Another reason, reduce your own distress. The third reason is there's many misperceptions about the consequences of not accommodating. Both the individual with OCD has these misperceptions and so do those of us who care about the person with OCD. And that misperception is that if I don't do anything to get rid of anxiety, it's going to last forever and it's never going to go away. If I don't get rid of this uncomfortable thought or feeling, it's never going to go away and it's going to keep looping in my mind. If I don't engage in this compulsion that what I'm worried is going to happen is going to actualize, I am going to die or I am going to contract COVID or some other illness. Or I'm going to get other people sick and they're going to be mad at me and it's going to be all my fault. And what we know through engaging in exposure over time is that those things often don't happen. And when they do, they're not to the extent to which the individual perceives them to be. So even if one were to get sick, they're going to recover right? COVID's a little different. We know that. And obviously right now we're handling things very differently. But if we're thinking about a cold or a common cold or a foodborne illness, those things are fairly unlikely if you're touching everyday items like a doorknob. We actually even know now with COVID that COVID isn't really spread on surfaces or objects. Um, the CDC just released new guidelines today saying that you really only need to wash down certain surfaces with soap and water, just like we did prior to COVID. Um, and they've done a lot of controlled studies um, in environments where people were COVID positive and they tested those surfaces. And what they found was there was no live active virus on those surfaces. There was just the dead capsules or cells. And so we know that it's respiratory. That's how it spread. It spread through respiratory droplets and being in close proximity to others, which is why we were a mask. So, so even in this time of COVID, an individual with OCD is engaging in excessive compensatory strategies than what the CDC is recommending or what's necessary to mitigate that risk. The fourth reason is when an individual forcibly imposes accommodation on their family member or coheres them. And this um, I see more often with younger kids um, or adolescents, but you can see it in partners as well in adults um, where they might say things like, if you don't do this for me, you don't love me. Um, or you don't understand how hard this is for me. You're not helping. Um, or if you don't do this, I'm going to go break this really important object of yours in the home. Um, if you don't comply and do what my OCD wants you to do by washing your hands um, or wiping down all of these items in the home, I'm going to kill myself. And all of these things are attempts to escape anxiety. So oftentimes the individual doesn't want to do these things and they're not intending to, but they feel like they have no other choice but to do those things in order to get you to understand how distressed they are and to help them escape that situation. And the hard thing in this situation is we know that if we give in and accommodate, we're making the problem worse and we're feeding OCD. And sometimes it's hard in that moment to not accommodate because the other individual isn't in the state of mind when they're so anxious to be able to understand that what you're doing is helping them. 
but it's really important that we start to reduce these accommodations out because as long as you're accommodating one's OCD, there's no option for them to do anything differently. And so if you're wiping down the counter or doorknobs for them, they don't have to, they feel less anxious, but now it's at the cost of you having to perform all of these behaviors for them, which is going to negatively impact your relationship. And so the first step is when you stop accommodating, the individual experiences a great deal of distress and they're faced with an option that they either have to ritualize and wash that doorknob or wipe down that surface, or they have to choose to sit with feeling contaminated and not wash. But once you're in that place, now we can do something different. Now we can make an active decision to engage in exposure gradually in a really controlled way with the help of a therapist in order to train your brain that this item you perceive to be unsafe is not and that you can touch it and that that anxiety will come down. And then you start to take back your life. You start to be able to do more and more things and OCD no longer controls or dictates how you behave in the world. So what are the different types of accommodation? Okay, we've already started to give certain examples, but the main one is participating in behaviors that allow others to avoid experiencing their distress. And so, this can be like the child who's at school and they're really anxious and they go to the nurse's station because they feel like they're going to get sick or they feel like they're going to throw up and they call home and you pick them up and you allow them to come home and escape the anxiety provoking situation with just school. And so for somebody who has a fear of germ contamination, they may also have a fear of getting sick and vomiting. And they might also have a comorbid vomit phobia. And so in this situation, someone's at school, they might touch something they perceive to be contaminated. They're not able to wash their hands. They touch their face. They get really anxious. They start to worry they're going to throw up. They go to the nurse's office. The nurse checks them out. The nurse says, you don't have a temperature. You seem okay. Um, tries to encourage them to go back into the classroom. But the kid's so anxious at this point, all they want to do is go home. Somewhere they know is safe, where they're with somebody that can take care of them, usually their mom or dad. And so the nurse ends up finally calling home. The parent is worried. So the parent comes home, takes the child home. The child gets home. There's a drastic reduction in anxiety. Kid feels much better. Now the kid's playing video games, having a good time. Now he's getting re reinforced to be home because he's in a safe environment where he feels comfortable. He's doing something enjoyable. And so the next day when it's time to get to school, now he's associated school with vomiting or getting sick and that uncomfortable physical sensation of anxiety. And now he's refusing to go to school. And so not accommodating in this scenario would be validating your child. I know you're having a hard time, but it's really important you stick it out through the day and I'll see you at the end of the day. And the more you do that, by the end of the week, that child is no longer going to be as distressed as they were. And they're going to learn that I can feel anxious. I can have this thought of getting sick and throwing up. And I stayed in this situation and it didn't happen. So that's one example. Another one might be buying supplies for family members. So someone with contamination uh, OCD, it might be buying excessive amounts of toilet paper or soap. So people will go through a lot of soap and toilet paper in a short period of time to the point where families are noticing they're spending a lot of money and they're going shopping more frequently than they normally would and they're stocking up on supplies. And so 
rather than limiting the amount of toilet paper used or the amount of soap used when washing hands, they're continuing to buy more and more products for the individual to use, and they need to use more and more of those products over time. Um, and that can start small with one pump of soap all the way up to 10 pumps of soap. It could be being in the shower for 15 minutes to being in, a shower, in the shower for an hour using a half bottle of sh shampoo or body wash. Um, the other one is um, engaging in compulsions. And so they say, oh, you can't touch that. So now you're not touching certain items in the home or you're asking permission for what items you can touch. Another one might be, now you're washing your hands after touching, touching certain items you wouldn't have washed your hands in the past. And so OCD not only affects the individual, it starts to infect the entire family system. And so now it almost feels like you yourself have OCD because you're engaging in the same types of compulsions and avoidance behaviors that the individual is. The other one, which is probably the most common and, and oftentimes the least talked about is reassurance seeking. And reassurance seeking is when somebody excessively asks you or repeatedly asks you the same question over and over again in order to feel less anxious and to reassure themselves that what they're worried about isn't going to happen. So this might be the kid who phones home and says, you're sure I'm not gonna get sick, right? Or I touched that doorknob, do you think it was dirty? Do you think I need to wash my hands? Or maybe with harm OCD, it's they drive to work and they get out of their car and they get into their workplace and they call you and they say, I think I might've hit a car, do you think I should go out and check my car? Or do you think I hit anyone on the way to work? And so the common theme in reassurance questions is that the question they're asking, you can't answer. You don't know the answer to the question or you're not an authority figure on the matter. And so if I'm worried that I have a brain tumor because I have a headache and now I'm worried I'm gonna get cancer and I ask you, do you think I have cancer? You're not a doctor, you don't know. And so when you reassure somebody, they often want you to, to give them a very specific, concrete answer. So you might say, I'm not sure, and that's not satisfying. So they keep asking until you say, no, you're not going to get sick. No, you don't have cancer. No, nothing bad is going to happen, I promise. And so reassurance can really wreak havoc because the more you reassure, the more the individual is going to come to you seeking reassurance. And eventually at this point, you're kind of lying to the individual. You're telling them what they want to hear, even though you don't know if what you're telling them is true. The other one is modification of family routines. And so this might look like allowing a family member to shower before a sibling because they won't shower after the sibling showers because if the sibling goes in the shower, now they've contaminated the shower and the shower's not clean. It could look like leaving work early to pick your uh, son or daughter up from school so that they don't have to wait in a big crowd of people in a long line or picking them up from school instead of having them take the bus because they're worried if they take the bus, what if they get sick and vomit on the bus? Or because the bus is contaminated. Or if it's harm OCD, that maybe the bus is going to crash and I'm gonna die. I'm never gonna see you again. And so anytime you're changing your own routine to accommodate another's behavior, that often is because you're trying to get rid of their anxiety or to prevent them from experiencing or encountering a situation that causes distress. So again, this is a list from the IOCDF that goes over other different ones. So we've kind of already gone through these, but again, really quickly participating in the behavior, assisting in avoidance, helping with behaviors. Um, so again, a modification routine might be 
washing dishes for somebody. So kids who have certain chores they're supposed to perform, you might be performing them for the individual, or you may allow them to engage in a different set of chores. And now another sibling in the home environment has to do the less desirable chores. So cleaning a toilet versus vacuuming the living room. All right, so you might allow the individual germ contamination OC to vacuum instead of cleaning the toilet where the other sibling is now always responsible for cleaning the toilet. And, and there starts to become a conflict between the two children. Um, another one, right, taking on extra responsibilities. Um, this might look like driving a different route to school to avoid passing a cemetery, because if you drive by a cemetery, the thought might be that some unknown spirit is going to cause harm to me and we're going to die. Um, so now you're going out of your way and you're driving 20 minutes longer to go the back route. Um, other things might be like you not leaving the house. And so you need to go somewhere but your child won't go, and so now you're stuck home. Um, and so all of these things are different ways in which family members accommodate. And at first we do it because it really makes our lives easier at first, but the more you accommodate, the more accommodation behaviors you have to engage in, and the, the less flexibility you have in your everyday life. So people often ask me, well, how do I know if I'm accommodating? Um, because sometimes we do things out of habit. And oftentimes we also do things out of courtesy. It's so like we might often open a door for people because it's the polite thing to do. But if you're always opening the door for your child, you might want to ask yourself, like, is it because they're not willing to touch the doorknob because they're worried it's contaminated? Or they can, and it's just something I like to do because it makes me feel like I'm helping them out um, or being polite. Um, and so the first way I think about this, if you're becoming really upset or finding yourself angry at your family member um, when you do things for him or her, you're not really doing it because you want to. You're doing it because you feel obligated to do it in order to ensure that they're not uncomfortable or distressed. And so opening a doorknob for somebody might make you feel good because it's based on a value of being polite and courteous. And that feels good. But if every time you go to leave the house, your child or partner stands at the door and refuses to leave until you open it, you're going to start to get frustrated with your partner, especially on a day when you might be running late, or your hands are full. And they no longer can perform the action and they're waiting for you to do it for them. Um, you could ask yourself like, are there things I'm doing now that I never used to do before? Right? So I never used to wipe down all the doorknobs or check all the locks before going to bed at night to ensure that they're locked and that nothing bad's going to happen. But now I'm noticing I'm doing that every night before I go to bed. And I never used to do that. Um, do you find your partner or your child is always asking you the same questions over and over again? And when you do answer them truthfully and honestly, do you find that they get agitated or irritated or angry at you and start to demand that you rephrase or change the way, change your answer? Um, are you putting up with things that you would normally not allow? Um, so this goes to that coercion piece. Like if somebody's kind of threatening you to perform a behavior and you're doing it, but it's not something you would normally do or tolerate, then that can also be an indicator that you're accommodating. Um, and are there things you avoid doing or saying? So you might avoid sharing information with somebody out of a fear that it might trigger an obsession or might cause somebody to become overwhelmed or anxious.
Again, a couple more, you know, a lot of these are redundant as you're seeing, um, but are you allowing them to avoid situations? You know, if they're afraid to go over a friend's house, are you having um, all of the friends come over to your house for play dates? Um, if your partner is not willing to drive to work because they're worried about hitting someone or getting in a car accident, are you finding yourself rearranging your schedule and always driving them to work in place of them driving themselves? Um, will you only take a certain clean car? Maybe one car becomes contaminated and now you're um, only allowed to pick up your child in a certain type of car, so you have to switch cars with your uh, spouse or partner. Um, Again, we talked about this one. Do you do things that you normally wouldn't do? Um, and I think the biggest one and the last one on this list is, does your family member become upset, aggressive, tantrum, or shut down when you don't accommodate? So a good way to know is if someone's requesting you to do something and you're not sure, ask first. Have a dialogue. Hey, I noticed you keep asking me this question or, I noticed every time you leave the house, you wait for me to open the door. What's going on here? Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Like, is it, is it, does it, are you avoiding touching it? And at that point, if they say no, and then say, okay, well, why don't you open it? And if you get a lot of resistance or you get like a child has a tantrum or they start to get short tempered or, or irritated, that's a good indicator there's something else going on in the background that's um, leading them to feel like they can't engage in that behavior or resist engaging in the compulsion. So how does accommodation function? Okay, the main way in which accommodation works is it allows escape from anxiety producing situations and it results in a reduction in distress, although temporary, okay? It prevents the family member from warning, learning that anxiety is transient and that it will pass over time. Think back to that habituation model. The longer you sit with anxiety, the quicker it will pass. When you try to suppress or get rid of anxiety, the more it's gonna stay around and the stronger it's gonna become. So when you accommodate, you're actually preventing your family member from learning that the anxiety will pass on its own without you intervening and that what they're worried about isn't going to happen. It prevents the family member from learning um, that the more they avoid, the stronger the feared outcome, the stronger the anxiety prevents them from learning that their outcome is unlikely. And so when we're always doing exposures, we're designing them so that there's always an expectancy violation. And so the goal of exposure is not to get rid of anxiety. That's the role compulsions play or avoidance plays in the model. Exposure is intentionally sitting with the anxiety, engaging in the behavior that triggers the obsession and then asking yourself, okay, what am I worried is going to happen? What do I expect is going to happen if I engage in this situation? Let me do it. Let me notice where my anxiety is in my body. Let me notice what thoughts are showing up for me. I'm going to wait 30 minutes all the way up until an hour at some points. And after the 30 minutes, an hour, you're going to check back and say to yourself, like, was what I worried was going to happen happened? And did my anxiety come down? And so sometimes that happens within the session, within that one exposure exercise. But what's more common is that it happens between sessions, meaning after several trials across varying contexts with different types of stimuli, that the anxiety comes down and you start to be able to better tolerate the situation and engage in it in a way that's meaningful without relying on a safety behavior or a compulsion or without having a family member accommodate you. The biggest thing I want to leave you with is the more you accommodate, 
the more they're going to worry about the thing they're afraid is going to happen, the more they're going to engage in compulsions and the more they're going to avoid. And so actually, even though when you accommodate, it feels like you're doing the right thing, you're actually prolonging the individual's distress and you're not allowing them the opportunity to learn that what they're worried is going to happen is unlikely. And you're not modeling for them that they're strong enough to be able to tolerate the discomfort and be able to engage in these situations that they were previously avoiding. So if we were to go back to our cognitive model again, right? Family accommodation takes the place of compulsions. So as long as you're accommodating, the individual doesn't need to perform a ritual, but the more you have to engage in behaviors that you normally wouldn't engage in, in order to allow the person you care about to function in the world. And they never learn how to do that independent of you. So really, you are maintaining the cycle the more you accommodate. And so, we need to engage in direct exposures, sit with unwanted thoughts and feelings, resist engaging in a compulsion, resist accommodating, and ride it out. And the more you do that, the better off you'll be. So the first thing we want to do to reduce accommodation is we want to identify what is the type of behavior we're seeing and what's the function of it. And so I notice every time we touch, my child touches the doorknob, they wash their hands. What's the function of that? The function of them washing their hands is to reassure themselves that they're not going to get sick and to reduce their anxiety. Okay, now we know why they're doing the behavior. Then we want to work together with the family member or the individual and with their therapist to start to come up with a hierarchy of different ways in which we're accommodating and gradually reduce out those accommodations. And so I always say, don't just stop accommodating. This is probably the worst thing you can do because as if you were to say, okay, starting tomorrow, I'm no longer going to accommodate any of this behavior. You're going to see with children, adolescents, increased physical aggression towards you because it's going to activate that fight or flight response. And if they can't escape an anxiety provoking situation, they're going to fight you. They're going to push, they're going to kick, they're going to break things, they're going to scream, they're going to tantrum. And all of that is okay if it's done in a controlled way. And so if we say, okay, starting this week, we're going to, we're going to remove this piece, just this one piece, and we're going to ride out this behavior, they might escalate, they might get aggressive, they might scream, they might tantrum. But on the fifth day, the intensity of that tantrum should diminish. And the duration, the length of time from the start of the tantrum to its peak will get smaller and smaller until you experience what's known as an extinction burst and the behavior no longer works. And then they no longer continue to engage in that compulsion over time. But you need to do this in a really controlled way with the guidance and feedback from a trained exposure therapist. You wanna be consistent. So if you start to reduce accommodation, you have to do it consistently, okay? It's got to be a ratio one-to-one -one reinforcement, okay? Um, you want to frame why you're not accommodating in a way where the family member is on board, understands why you're not providing it, and is in agreement with you not providing that level of accommodation. And so you're collaborating together to come up with a strategy and a plan for what to do in certain situations 
and you're getting the patient on board to say, when I ask you this question, I want you to tell me, I want you to not answer it. Or I want you to tell me something like maybe, or I'm not sure, instead of giving me the reassurance I'm seeking. Or when I ask you to wash your hands, I want you to not wash your hands. And I want you to say something like, I know you really want me to wash my hands right now, but I don't really feel like I need to. And I think that's your OCD. And so is it okay if I don't right now? Because I don't want to give in to OCD. And I know that if I do, it's going to make it worse. And so you're starting to work together to gradually reduce it out. And remind yourself again of the function and the consequence of accommodating. If you continue to accommodate, your loved one's never going to get better. And you have an active role you can play in helping them be able to recover from OCD. And you also want to be firm and empathetic. So set your limit, explain your rationale for why, and validate the individual's experience and feelings. So we don't want to be punitive. We don't want to be condescending. We don't want to use a negative tone of voice. We want to shore up with them. So it's no longer you against your child, you against your partner. It's you against OCD. It's your partner against OCD. It's you and your partner against OCD. So you are now a united front against OCD and you're working as a team to not give in, to not accommodate and to support the person you love in not engaging in a compulsion and sitting with them in that anxiety and riding it out with them together. So my final thoughts on this is Learn everything and anything you can about OCD. There are great resources out there. There's OCD Rhode Island, which is a local affiliate um, of the International OCD Foundation. There's the International OCD Foundation. If you're out of state, there's often many local affiliates throughout the country. Um, there's OCD Massachusetts. There's OCD Connecticut locally. There's OCD New Hampshire. Um, and there's other local affiliates um, again, on the West Coast, in the South, all over the place. And they have um, valid information about what OCD and what the treatment is by reputable sources and experts in the field. Make OCD the problem, not your family member. If OCD wasn't around, your family member wouldn't be engaging in these behaviors. And so Yes, they have control over how they respond to their thoughts and feelings, but when they're feeling really overwhelmed, it might be hard for them to access those skills and they might need your support in that moment to slow down and help them make a decision that will benefit them in the long run. Um, stop giving advice. You know, I, I think it's, I use the example of, um, if you've ever been really angry and somebody tells you to calm down, what usually happens? You get more angry. It never really works. And so oftentimes what people say or do in the context of OCD, which comes from a good place, but isn't really helpful is, well, just stop doing that. Or well, why don't you just stop thinking about that? Or you know what? Um, why don't you avoid and now you're kind of, again, giving them this feedback and advice that one, they already know, two, isn't very helpful. And also three is often contraindicated in terms of what the evidence-based treatment is telling these individuals to do. And that can be really confusing for the individual. Um, give really specific labeled praise. I'm so proud of you for doing that. I know how hard that was. For young kids, build in rewards. If you can resist washing your hands, um, you know, I don't know, six out of 12 times today, uh, you can get this reward or uh, we can go get ice cream. 
um, clarify your values. Why is it important for you to not give into OCD and engage in this compulsion right now? An example I give is, what if someone you really cared about was beyond that door and they fell and they broke their leg? Would you open that door? Would you be willing to touch that door handle and get dirty in order to help that person get to safety? And every single person that you would say, of course I would. So find the value behind it. Why is it important for you to stop washing your hands after touching these items? Why is it important for you to go into that situation that makes you anxious and uncomfortable? What, what can you win out of that? What, can, what is important about doing that? Um, ask them to rate their anxiety. This is something we do in therapy all the time. We use a SUD scale, um, which is known as, uh, it stands for subjective units of distress or discomfort. And basically it's a zero to 10 scale, similar to a pain scale. And we just say like, you seem really overwhelmed right now. How anxious are you right now from zero to 10? And then you can ask them to slow down and ask like, where are you noticing it in your body? Do you notice this? Is there tightness in your chest? Do you feel tense? You know, what can I do to help you right now? And then help them to not avoid. Encourage them to approach situations that make them uncomfortable without accommodating and provide them with the encouragement and the motivation to take that risk. And lastly, really come up with a plan to reduce accommodation. So if your loved one is not connected with an OCD provider, help them get connected. If you're not sure how to handle it, reach out to your individual um, therapist. Ask your partner if you can be involved in treatment. There's great books out there um, on how to help family members reduce accommodation and how to help them support their family member in the moment. So it goes back to learn everything you can, reach out, get support, join a support group, um, go on social media, um, work with a therapist to help come up with a plan to reduce accommodation. All of those things will help in moving through OCD and slowly being able to win back your life um, and take back your home. So this concludes my talk for today. I'm happy to answer more questions. As you can see, OCD is really complex. There's a whole host of different types of obsessions and compulsions people experience. Tonight, we really focused on contamination as our baseline for just being able to be concrete and giving specific examples of different types of ways in which family members accommodate and different strategies for reducing accommodation. But the treatment is the same regardless of the type of obsession or the type of compulsion one is experiencing. And so feel free to email me, um, feel free to call, um, and I will try my best to get back to you um, with any answers that, uh, to the questions you may have. Um, and also if there's questions about local resources or how to get connected to a therapist, I'm happy to answer all of those questions as well and help get you connected um, to the services that we offer. Um, so thank you very much for, for joining me today. I hope this was helpful. And again, please feel free to reach out. Um, whether that's through email or through messaging um, the OCD Rhode Island Facebook page directly. I hope you all have a great evening. Um, and I hope to see you all again soon.